Hello, everyone. I'm Ronnie Arispe uh, with the Permian Basin or SPE Permian Basin chapter of Data Analytics Study Group. Uh, welcome to uh, this month's webinar uh, with SEEK. We've got Kiel and Sepp with us going to present on Pasture Times to Insight at Scale. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, the structure of today's webinar. Um, they will present for a while and then uh, they're going to take turns, Kiel and then Sepp. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, I'll MC Q&A. You have two options for that. You can either go ahead and type your question into the question panel, and I'll read that out loud for you. Or you can raise your hand um, in the attendee panel. You can raise your hand, and then um, I'll call on you and allow you to ask your question verbally. So without further ado, let's go ahead and kill. If you want to go ahead and kick us off. Absolutely. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. So thank you everyone uh, for being with us today. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about Seek and how you can get faster time to insights um, at scale through a few use cases. Um, so first we'll do some quick intros. My name is Kiel Ramlunk. I'm a senior analytics engineer with Seek. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half now. Um, and I'm currently a customer success manager for a few of our uh, oil and gas customers. Um, my background is in the upstream oil and gas industry in Canada, where I spent about uh, 10 years or so before joining Seek. Um, and I was actually a Seek customer before uh, joining the Seek team. So that's how um, I moved over. And with me today is my colleague, Sepp, and I'll let her do a quick introduction as well. Thank you, Kiel. Hi everyone, my name is Sefide Zakeri. My background is in petroleum as well as instrumentation and automation engineering. Uh, similar to Kiel, I am responsible for uh, supporting different customers with different type of projects or if they have different type of questions. Also, I am a little bit involved in deploying some of our advanced tools for uh, different projects for the customers. And I will be presenting uh, with uh, Kiel uh, alongside uh, during this presentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So what we'll be talking about today, um, you know, I'll be going through a few slides. I'm going to try to minimize the amount of time in the slides. Uh, just introducing you to Seek and what the application does. And then we'll do a brief uh, kind of Seek demo just to show you the lay of the land and the software and how you can build a uh, use case from scratch. And then we'll be going through three um, applicable use cases, so real life use cases um, that we've worked uh, as Seek for, with some of our customers. Uh, the first one will be looking at a bearing failure on a compressor. Then we'll build on that use case by looking at how you can integrate some of machine learning algorithms uh, into Seek to be able to collaborate between end users, subject matter experts, and uh, data scientists. And then the third use case is we'll kind of show you how you could scale and analytic across uh, your entire well base. So first off, what is Seek? It's an advanced analytics application that's purpose built for time series data. Uh, and the real intent is that it empowers end users, uh, such as yourselves, you know, engineers, subject matter experts, um, you know, to really do the analytics yourself uh, in the tool. And that then allows you to gain insights to improve that operational uh, performance. So it's super quick to install, uh, really quick time to value. You can see we connected data uh, real fast. And we're also very uh, applicable across a variety of different uh, verticals. So you know, upstream oil and gas, downstream oil and gas, midstream, but also other um, such as pharmaceutical, power generation, you know, discrete manufacturing. So Seek is not just a one trick pony. We can apply to a variety of different industries. What does Seek look like? Um, you know, we've got three applications, which are shown at the top of the screen. The middle one is the workhorse. This is what we call Workbench. Uh, this is where you'll search for data, apply those different analytics, create those different visuals that will drive that insightful information for you. On the left of that is the Seek Organizer. This is where you can build uh, either static reports or dashboards, um, and they can then compile all those different learnings from Workbench into one nice central place that you can then share uh, with your coworkers throughout the organization. 
On the far right, we have Seek Data Lab. This is a Python, it's a Jupyter Notebooks environment um, that allows you to interact with the data in Seek Workbench and also create custom visuals to then push over um, to Seek Organizer. And you'll see uh, an example of that today. You know, it leverages our Seek Python module, uh, which allows you to do some pushing and pulling uh, in between the actual Seek applications. All of that sits in our Seek server called Seek Cortex. This could be an on-premise installation or it could be in the cloud. Um, and below that, you'll see all the different data sources that we uh, connect to. So wherever you store your data, Seek can typically connect with a variety of native connectors. You'll see anywhere from cloud data stores, process historians, SQL databases, all the way to some custom sources, um, you know, where you might store like lab data and all that type of stuff. And on, on the integration side of things, we can also, you know, integrate OData export into Power BI, Spotfire, Tableau, stuff like that. So uh, a nice tool that integrates with whatever you have in your stack today, but provides the end users with a nice analytics application. Now, we all know there are lots of challenges with time series data, and that's really what Seek was purpose built to address. Um, you know, you might have data that's coming in from a variety of sources, and it might be sampled at you know, different you know, sampling frequencies. You could have process data every 30 seconds, lab data every 12 hours. How do you reconcile doing a calculation on those um, two different signals, right? So you might have to do a bunch of pre-processing to align samples and all that kind of stuff. Trending inherently comes with a variety of issues like noise in the data. Um, you, know, you could simply have erroneous data as well. How do we handle that before you then push it into a model um, to get some sort of results? You know, difficult calculations like integration, right? How do you take the area under a trend? Um, establishing boundaries, you know, to say, if I go above or below a certain threshold, I want to be alerted of that. And then finally, contextualizing your data with time periods of interest, right? When I go above that limit, let me know what I'm looking at and also maybe give me some information about what's happening during those specific periods. So that's really what Seek Workbench um, specifically was built to handle. Um, as we connect to the data sources, we align the data so that you can do your analytics uh, no matter where the data is coming from, no matter what the sampling frequency might be. We then provide packaged analytics tools that allow you to search and cleanse, do some aggregations, modeling, and then eventually monitor um, solutions on and around your data. Variety of visualization options, you'll see trending, bar charts, XY scatter plot, uh, as well as table view. And it will also show you what we call a tree map, which is an ability to see your analytics scaled across the asset base. I think the final piece, knowledge capture, uh, I think this is extremely important, right? Being able to document the steps that have been taken in an analysis, uh, or even being able to share the final analysis easily with your coworkers to really be able to you know, share those insights across uh, the corporation. So you'll see some of that capability today as well in the use cases. Um, finally, Seek Data Lab. So that's kind of the you know, Python environment, which really allows you, um, you know, to integrate and share whatever uh, code you might've already developed, right? So you might have a data science team or you are a data scientist that has built an algorithm. How do you then integrate it with let's say the process engineering or the production engineering team. Those are folks that are very used to a trending type interface. Um, you know, being able to operationalize those model results into Seek Workbench so that those individuals can visualize the process data alongside the model data uh, is extremely valuable for, you know, your work as a data scientist to really be, uh, you know, used well by the end user. So all of that wraps up into, you know, what can Seek do for you? Um, you can look at diagnostic analysis. So why did something happen, right, in the past? Predictive, what is going to happen based on, you know, maybe what's happening right now? Uh, you might be monitoring assets, right? So just getting an understanding of how am I operating right now? Uh, what boundaries am I within or without? And then looking more at prescriptive and descriptive, if you know what's supposed to be happening, why is that not happening or what should be happening? Um, so all those things then wrap up based on all those tools that we have. And you'll see kind of a spread of, um, of these in the use cases that we'll be uh, presenting today. So with that, I'm gonna jump into a quick uh, Seek demo. I think seeing is easier um, than hearing. So I'll drop from the slides here and move over into uh, Seek.
So Seek is a browser-based application, so you can access it from anywhere, especially if it's deployed uh, in the cloud. Um, and then once you log in, you get to this home screen. And you'll see in the top left, we've got this new button that allows you to start any one of these three applications that make up Seek. We're gonna start our day kind of in Workbench, taking a look at all the different analytics uh, tools that you can apply to data. We'll look a little bit about organizer topic and show you how you can then gather all that information into a report. Um, and then Seth will later on show Data Lab and how that application then it integrates uh, with the other one. So I'll jump over into Workbench. Uh, when you drop into Workbench, you'll see it's very similar to Excel. It's green in color. Uh, this is where you do all your analytics and calculations. You've got worksheets on the left-hand side. Um, and the first tab you'll see is this uh, data tab. So this is where you can come in and search for data. So let's say I'm looking for uh, just a signal or a tag that's called temperature. I can type that in and I'm going to get a variety of uh, temperature results. Now this might be a pretty common uh, tag name. So you can filter your data search by going into maybe just looking at signals and perhaps I want to constrain it to a specific data source. So we talked about being able to connect to you know, cloud data stores, process historians. Maybe you know that it's coming from a specific data source. I know this is coming from my example data and I want to sort it alphabetically so I can then refine my search results. Now I can see kind of an alphabetized list and maybe I'll grab some of these temperatures uh, that I'm seeing on the screen right away. So with that, I've now got my trends showing on the screen. Perhaps I extend my time duration. I'm looking at about a day's worth of duration. Maybe I want to look at a week. So I just extend that to seven days. And now I've got seven days worth of data showing on the screen. One thing to note about Seek is we don't copy the data over. So we don't ETL your data from wherever it's stored. We simply index your data source. And then when you ask for a certain display range, we go and grab those samples. Uh, from the data source, and we know where to find it because we've indexed your entire uh, data source. So that's why it's so quick to get access to your data and also really quick to connect um, because we don't have to go and move, you know, gigabytes worth of data over um, into a different data store. So that's where the data is. Now I can do some different visualizations. Maybe I want to overlay these temperatures um, in the same trend. Maybe that's something I just visually want to do a comparison between these four different signals. Um, the other thing that I could do now that I have my data is I could start applying some different analytics, right? So I can move around in time, visualize trends. Now let's go ahead and actually get some insight out of this data that we're looking at. In this case, I'm going to apply a tool called value search. I just want to see, for instance, when uh, one of my temperatures is in a high, you know, temp situation. I'm gonna grab this area A temperature and I'm gonna look for where, you know, maybe it exceeds, let's say uh, 98 degrees. What you'll see now at the top of the screen is what we call capsules. Uh, these are periods of interest or events that meet a certain condition. So the condition we've provided here, temperature greater than 98 degrees. And now I'm seeing at the top of the screen visually all the places that that exists for my area A temperature. Right, so if I just look at area A, that one temperature signal, I can then see that all these capsules line up nicely where wherever this temperature is indeed high and above 98 degrees. I can also get some information about these capsules here in the bottom right. I can get information like the start date as well as the duration. So if I sort by duration as I've done here, you know, maybe I can select just the top, let's say three or four longest capsules because maybe I wanna do some analysis on those long events. Maybe I want to visualize just those events side by side. So I've selected those four events and now what I'm seeing on the screen is just the portions of the data that happened during each of those capsules. The benefit of seeing these side by side, maybe I want to do a side by side comparison. If I'm above 98, am I always kind of in the same temperature range or is it sometimes barely above, sometimes it exceeds by 10 degrees, you know, what's my data doing in those periods? So we've just removed every, you know, all the other samples that are in between. And I can always come and check the exact data points, so the actual samples uh, coming from the historian. You can now see them as data points. I can clearly see 
uh, the ones that are actually coming from my data source. Another view that we can explore and seek is called capsule view. Again, leveraging those capsules we've created, but now what we're doing is we're overlaying those capsules on top of one another. Um, we're putting the start time all at zero and then letting the data come depending on how long the capsule is. But this might be nice, especially you know, in the upstream oil and gas industry, we do a lot of well tests. You know, Maybe you wanna compare the flow rates of different well tests to each other. So this gives you a nice way of quickly visualizing that to see if one of your tests is like way out to lunch and then maybe you can go and remove it from your you know production accounting software um, you know this is kind of a nice way to leverage this capsule time um, as well as the the chain view you know to be able to visualize that differently so that's just kind of a real quick and dirty on uh, what we can do with the trending interface and, and different visualizations what i'd like to do now is jump to this third tab uh, called the journal. And this is where that knowledge capture piece comes into play. This is where you can document the steps that you take in analysis. It's basically like a word type editor, right? I can type in here. Um, and what I've done here is I've just preloaded a demo example use case that I quickly want to run through just to give a bit more context rather than just, you know, trending some random stuff um, for this case. So the scenario here is that let's say I have a set of uh, cooling tower which have some compression. Uh, I wanna ensure that I'm running those compressors as efficiently as possible to minimize my OPEX. Common use case these days, right? Maximize production for as little money as possible. Um, the objective here is I wanna know when I'm operating those compressors in a bad state. I'm gonna use some logic here to say that when my compressor is in stage two and my temperature is less than 80 degrees, I will consider that to be bad. Uh, and then I want to know how much power am I consuming during those bad periods. That's going to give me an idea of how much money am I losing when I'm running this compressor poorly. So the first thing we need to do is go grab some data. Go back to the data tab. Now previously we searched for specific tags and I could do that here. But I also want to talk about these asset trees. This is another way that we can visualize data um, in Seek. And for those of you that use OSI Pi Process Historian as your uh, data source, you'll know that you also have the capability to create a asset framework, uh, basically some sort of logical grouping of your data, a hierarchy. Um, so if you have an AF framework, we can mirror that here in Seek. We just pull it in and show it. The, if you just have data stored in a uh, data store and you've got a bunch of tags and you'd like to organize them in a hierarchy, uh, you can do that through Seek Data Lab as well. In this case, I've got this example asset tree that I want to use. So I'm going to click on that highest level. Below it, I've got a couple of different cooling towers. And below that, I have a few different areas underneath which I have some tags. The ones I care about here today, compressor power, compressor stage, and temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and pull those onto uh, the screen. Now, I just want to jump over back to journal for a sec. I've now completed the first step of my analysis that I've kind of pre-documented here. What I can now do is instead of just having the steps typed out, I can actually link this step with what we call a seek work step link. So I'll go and grab this work step. And what this allows me to do is in future, let's say I'm a different user and I come in here, I try to understand the steps that were taken in the analysis. I can then click on this link and it's gonna take me back to that work step. Um, so this is kind of like a visual bookmark of the step where you're at in the analysis. And this makes it really handy. You pass this analysis on to someone else. They can come in here and fully understand, okay, he trended the signals. I can click on that link and understand exactly uh, what he was looking at at that time. So the next step here is to figure out what bad state, you know, how, which capsules are going to be defining bad state in this analysis. So the first step of that is to determine when this compressor is in stage two. You can see I have a string signal, which tells me the stage that I'm running in. So I can go to my tools and once again, use this value search tool to figure out when I'm in stage two. The signal that I'm going to search is my compressor stage signal. And I'm going to match, it's a string signal, so I can't you know, say equal or greater than. Uh, I'm just gonna match where it's equal to stage two. Once again, I've got capsules at the top of the screen, wherever this signal reads stage two. Again, I'll quickly 
take a link and document that step in the analysis. And now I want to also understand when my temperature drops below 80 degrees. So similar to the first value search we created, just going to create another one here and call this temp is less than 80. Grab my temperature signal and simply say where it's less than 80 degrees. Again, I'll document this step in my journal. And you can see again that we have new capsules now at the top of the screen. And what I'm really interested in for this specific analysis is the periods where these are overlapping, right? I wanna know when I'm in stage two and my temperature is below 80. Those are periods that I wanna call bad operating. And I've got a couple here that I can see visually already, but we can do that logically by using a different tool called a composite condition, where we can combine a couple conditions to form a third. So I'm gonna call this bad state. And I'm gonna make it red because it's bad. I wanna visually see it as bad. Um, and I'm just gonna take these two conditions we've created. And I'm gonna combine them with some logic. And you'll see there's a variety of options here, but we're just gonna go ahead and use the intersection logic. Both conditions must be present. All right, so we can see bad state has now been created here. And I'm just gonna zoom out again. And I wanna see over this, I'm now looking at a 14 day period, right, all the bad state events. So one thing to note about Seek is I created that calculation one time and irrespective of the date range that I create the calculation on, that logic is in Seek. So the calculation engine has already understood whenever you expand the date range, that calculation is already applied and whenever you visualize a different date range, so let's say I skip backwards for half a week, um, you know, you can see those bad state capsules are automatically already there. So that's another benefit of Seek is that you don't have to come in here and iterate on your calculations whenever uh, you need to make a change or, you know, anything like that. You just go ahead and put them in once and then for your entire time range, um, they'll be there. And you can keep stepping to the current time. So if you want to update this calc, as new data comes in, you can auto update or step to current time, and it's going to populate all that information for you. Again, I'm going to document this step. And I'm going to remove those other two conditions. I don't think we need those anymore. Uh, maybe I'll also remove this compressor stage. I should not need that in my analysis any longer, um, nor my temperature. What I really care about is the power that I'm consuming during each of these bad state events. So now we've got these capsules. I could maybe quickly look at them in chain view, right? What I'm trying to understand is, can I totalize the amount of power that's in my signal here, right? So essentially what I wanna do is take the integral of this trend over the period within each capsule. And we can do that using a tool called signal from condition. I'm gonna say total power in bad state. I'm going to select my compressor power signal and the statistic I'm going to apply is what we call totalize, but it's basically just taking the integral. I want my units in kilowatt hours, right? That's a commonly uh, used unit when talking about power consumption. And I wanted to calculate over these bad state capsules. I'm gonna place the values in the middle of each capsule. And now you can see I'm getting these bars, which are gonna give me the total kilowatt hours that I'm consuming in each of these capsules. So right now I'm still in chain view, so I'm just looking at these specific periods. Um, I could expand again calendar view and just look at this over uh, calendar time and how over this two week period, you know, all the different events, what power am I spending in each of those bad state events. So that's kind of given me the information that I'm looking for. And this might be a good visual to stop at and say, okay, I've got this insight. I can now you know, add up these numbers and get the total power in a month or whatever it might be. And again, you could leverage um, capsules, um, you know, leverage capsules and, and things like that um, and signal from condition to then do that calculation. In our case, maybe you want to visualize something in a table view, so the trend might be nice, um, but perhaps you want to look at the tabular view and you want to look at maybe the 
total power that we're in the bad state. And maybe you just want to look at the average over this two week period, like whenever I am operating in a bad state, how much power am I typically uh, using? Maybe you want to look at just the last capsule that's occurred, how much power was consumed uh, during that capsule. So that's kind of the tabular view here. You can see that I've selected the columns of average and last value. You know, I could also add in, let's say, standard deviation. Um, I could say the minimum, the maximum. So I can really build a table here with statistics that give me an idea of how much power I'm consuming in those bad states. The other thing, remember, we grab this data out of an asset tree. Um, as you can see here, cooling tower one has a variety of areas. What if I wanted to try to say, I've now built this for area A, can I get this information for areas you know, B, C, et cetera? Um, and we have a quick button here that allows you to scale this across an asset grouping. So if I wanna see all the areas in cooling tower one, I just toggle that and you can see that now the calculations have automatically applied to all my assets. So this kind of shows you the quick scalability in Seek to say I've calculated on a certain asset. I've got six or seven similar assets and you can think of this as wells, right? We all have 200, 300 wells, thousands of wells in our asset base. Um, do a calculation on one, quickly scale it out to all of them that are identical. Uh, and then you get a nice table here with all those statistics and data um, that you can then leverage for insightful information. So that's one option, right? You can just get those calcs expanded out through the asset base. Another visualization option could be a tree map, which is actually gonna look at does bad state occur in any of my areas? So again, leveraging this asset structure, we're looking at all the areas in cooling tower one. All the areas in red have some occurrence of bad state in the last two weeks, but we do have areas that don't. And if I wanted to examine one of these other areas that are red, we've done all our calculation and visualization in area A. Maybe I click on area H and it's going to do an asset swap of the base data. And it's actually now going to show me the data for area H. And now I can take a look here. I've got this one event that I could zoom into uh, where I meet my criteria for bad state. And it's gonna give me how much power did I consume in that time period. So just a pretty quick couple of visualization options that allow you to see uh, scaled across your asset base. You know, you can do it for monitoring, which is kind of the tree map view, or you can do it in a tabular view, uh, which is gonna give you more, you know, kind of data about uh, the signals themselves or in a tabular view, just show you what you're looking for. So that concludes this kind of quick seek demo. It's a quick little use case to show you some of the different visualizations and options and things that we can do uh, around scaling in Seek. And what I'd like to do now is jump into our first true use case that we're going to explore, um, which is a compressor bearing failure. Um, so I'm just gonna jump over to this next worksheet. Um, and this use case here is where a compressor bear bearing housing has failed and the team is investigating what's happened during a root cause. So I'm just gonna click this link here. We're actually gonna to jump to our other application called uh, Seek Organizer. And this is a, a root cause analysis report that was prepared by the team. So you can see the different personas that collaborated on this specific root cause. Um, they built this together. So maybe maintenance has found something, they took pictures, they've got a work order information. Um, reliability engineering has taken a look at the vibration bearings. And we'll actually dive into how the reliability engineer might have set up this investigative uh, analysis. But you can see process engineering could do their own, looking at the efficiency of how the compressor is operating. And finally, you could have a data scientist that goes in and tries to understand some deeper correlation between all the tags uh, surrounding the compressor to see what may or may not be going wrong. Um, so I just wanna jump back over to Workbench and we'll talk about this reliability engineering analysis. So the first step in this analysis, again, is to go and grab my data. Now, what happened is you can see on the far right, this is a vibration signal. You can see it operates smoothly as expected for a fair amount of time. And then eventually we kind of get this exponential increase on the trend. Um, and we know that the compressor failed right here. So we know that leading into failure, this vibration just took off 
And what we'd like to do uh, as a reliability team is A, we'd like to figure out, you know, what happened there. But mainly we'd also try to figure out, okay, how can we prevent this from happening again? So that's really what the focus is of this analysis. How can we put some sort of limit in place, perhaps train something to say, this is normal operation. Tell me when I'm no longer operating in a normal uh, threshold. So the first step in that analysis would be to identify kind of good and bad, right? So we know that bad is over here around this failure. And we know that good is over here when it's operating normally. So in this case, I've just used Seek's formula tool uh, to create a custom condition, just a date range, right? I'm just saying, in this case, April 20 to May 4 last year is going to be what I'm going to call a training window. So this is my normal operation. I know the unit is running as expected. Then from that information, I've got a training set of data. I can use some basic statistics to say, you know, what's the average of my uh, vibration signal during my good operating period? And let's maybe add a couple standard deviations on top of that to say, give you a little bit of tolerance to say, you know, statistically, where do I typically operate in my vibration signal when my unit is running as expected? And that's what we're doing here in the formula tool. You know, we're stringing a, a variety of functions together here to basically say, Take the average during my good and add four standard deviations to create an upper threshold. If my vibration goes above that threshold, I know my unit is starting to operate poorly. Um, so in formula, you'll see there's a variety of different functions you can apply. This is where the calculation engine really shines. You know, I talked about some of the point and click tools in the first demo. Here you start to see all the power uh, within Seek. If I just click on signal cleansing, you'll see there's a variety of functions here that you can use to filter signals, remove data, drop out liars, things like that. Um, and then again, aggregations, taking the average standard deviation, et cetera. So there's a lot here in formula. It's pretty powerful. Um, you know, there's a lot you can do here before you have to go to Python and run other algorithms. All right, so we've got our threshold built. You can see this limit here, dashed line. And we can see that this vibration does exceed our threshold leading into the failure. So, you know, if I talk about testing this data, I think, you know, the threshold I've built is quite good. When the unit's operating normally, like I am for most of this time period, I'm not exceeding the limit. And then later on leading into the failure, I do exceed my limit. So I just want to visually show that with a uh, capsule. So now I want to show a red capsule, and this is going to be in the future when this thing goes back online. This is going to be my notification capability to say, hey, something's gone wrong. And maybe I'm monitoring all my compressors in the field using a tree map like I showed in the demo where you've got all the red and green boxes. And basically any compressor with a vibration probe that goes red would then show me a red box. And then I know I should take some action, contact maintenance, uh, whatever it might be. So this analysis, again, applied to one probe. What we can do is scale it out to four probes, um, you know, basically apply the same logic in each of these thresholds, just doing that average plus four standard deviations. And then we've got this condition here, which is simply saying uh, it's an or statement. So if one of those vibration probes notes that they're above the limit, then notify me that there's an alert on this compressor. Uh, this was built on compressor 23. Maybe you build it out on compressor 45 as well. Um, and now in future, I think the reliability team would feel a lot better to say, okay, these vibration bearings are now being monitored. Um, and the neat thing is too, if I go back to this, you'll see, you know, I get about a week, 10 days notice before the failure, which is a fair amount of time for the maintenance team to potentially mobilize and do something about this unit. Um, so that, um, you know, that kind of concludes, you know, the, the first couple things we wanted to talk about today. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Sepa Danel, and she's going to run you guys through um, kind of expanding on this first use case to uh, build on, you know, the capability to add in some machine learning capability to say, okay, 10 days notice is cool, but what if we could get like three weeks notice? That's going to help us uh, down the way. So I'll just go ahead and hand it over to Seth now. Um, can you see my screen? 
Yes. OK, perfect. Thank you, Kiel. Um, as Kiel mentioned, and as you can see in here, uh, as a reliability engineer, we were able to kind of uh, plan our uh, preventive maintenance uh, efforts about a week before. But the question is, can we get a little bit more time to even plan ahead? And at this point, uh, basically what will happen, the uh, reliability engineer team would collaborate with the data scientist. And uh, maybe the data scientists have, um, they have some customized specific uh, Python machine learning tools that they want to apply to this data and make the results available for the reliability engineering team. So it doesn't matter if you want to use Azure ML, maybe you want to use a data lab, or maybe uh, AWS SageMaker. You can use any of those environments and um, kind of deploy uh, the code that you already have. In this case, we are going to use and uh, leverage the Seek Data Lab capabilities. So the next page that I'm going to uh, switch is our Seek Data Lab, which is um, basically is a a Python-based uh, environment that you can deploy any of the different tools that uh, you have. It can be a specific type of visualizations, or maybe if you have a custom machine learning code, you will be able to use it in here. As you can see, this is a Jupyter notebook, and um, basically we have some information about this specific uh, bearing failure and you get some information that was provided by the uh, process engineer. Also, uh, you can see that similar to any, any other uh, Python environment, we would be able to uh, kind of import different types of uh, libraries and uh, leverage and the capabilities that they are providing. However, uh, on the last line, you can see that uh, we are saying that from seek import a spy. This is actually the heart of the integration between seek data lab and uh, workbench analysis. And we are going to use that throughout uh, this example. The first step that we want to do in here is basically uh, since the uh, process engineer or the reliability engineer already uh, cleans the data, or maybe um, since they contextualize the data, we want to just use those as a starting point. So it will save lots of time for the data scientists since they don't need to do all of those data cleansing uh, again. Now, how we do that? We just use different type of functionality. The first one that I want to talk about is leveraging the spy.search, which basically looks at the previous workbook that Kiel showed and uh, search for all of the items that are provided within that workbook. You can see that uh, the list of the items that was in that workbook is in here. And uh, then the next step that we want to do, we want to kind of use some of those contextualized data. For example, the normal, um, time range that was provided by the reliability, we want to uh, search for those time uh, ranges as well. Now that we searched for all of those data, we are going to uh, leverage a, a spy.pool functionality to pull all of those data into this, um, this uh, Jupyter notebook. As you can see, this is a kind of a data frame that is available and we were able to just pull the data during the normal uh, operation, as well as uh, pulling the data during the whole time, which includes the uh, precursors of our failure event. Now, at this point, um, there are some other uh, libraries that the data science can make sure that these are actually, they are actually looking at the right amount of data and um, basically write data as well. Also, they would be able to bring their uh, customized machine learning models in here. So I'm not gonna go into the uh, kind of details of this code because for each company it is different and 
It depends on the different uh, applications that you have. But within this part, from once we pulled our contextualized data, we start uh, kind of um, doing our machine machine learning uh, modeling or kind of apply our custom codes. As you can see, there are different steps that was taken by the data scientists. They were able to train the model and then uh, kind of maybe analyze their model and validate their model. And finally, once they are happy with the results during our training window, they were able to kind of expand it for the whole time range that uh, we want to use. So once they apply their uh, model to the new data, the next step is actually create uh, some uh, results and push them back into the SIG workbench. So it makes it available for all of the uh, different process engineers and subject matter experts with no coding background. As you can see in here, now they are applying it to the whole time range to validate their model. And then they would be able to kind of create a signal that is highlighted in this last picture uh, by blue. As you can see in here, this is a bearing status signal. And whenever it is zero, it means that we are operating in a normal mode of operation. However, as soon as it jumps to one, there are some concerns and there are some abnormality uh, is happening within our data. Now that um, this is created by the data scientist, up to this point, it's just available for the data scientist or someone with the coding background. At this point, we are going to make it available for different groups of users by uh, leveraging the spy.push capability. As you can see in here, we are going to push back this results into the same workbench that we were. And you can see that it says that the push was successful and it pushed this um, bearing a status signal into the same workbench. I'm going to switch back to my workbench one more time. As you can see in here, now that we have the results of a uh, data scientist um, model, then we can bring it back and leverage the journal capabilities again, as Kiel mentioned, and bring it back to our screen. By using this uh, bearing a status signal and do a value search to identify whenever this bearing a status is a one, we were able to create create this uh, second capsule uh, or condition on the top of the screen, which eventually using the machine learning model, we were able to at least get um, notifications 11 days even before this uh, statistical uh, analysis. And this will help us to kind of plan ahead and uh, do the different uh, type of um, maintenance uh, uh, work that we want. With this, I am going to um, talk about another use case that is related to the uh, production uh, team. So the main objective of this use case is uh, basically the production engineering team, they wanted to have a dashboard that uh, kind of monitor uh, different um, content. One is they want to have a monthly mail production that, and they want to man, make sure that this monthly well production is within the target limits that was identified by the accounting team. Also, uh, they want to identify if there are some areas that is exceeding that target production. And then they want to uh, kind of identify the root cause for that. Maybe did that um, kind of excursions happen within the last week? Is it happened like earlier in the months and what caused that? In order to do that, we are going to again leverage the journal capability since I already created this. The first step is I summarized all of the raw data that I have been using within all of these different uh, pages because each page I'm summarizing one type of um, analysis and one type of approach to tackle a, a specific type of objective. 
Now, for this first page that I'm looking at, I want to create the monthly production, weekly, and daily production events and monitor them on a daily basis, weekly, or uh, depend on how frequent you want to monitor those metrics. I would start with my uh, raw oil uh, florid. And as you can see, I have it in my screen for this amount of time. Then the first step that we usually take with these time series data is data cleansing. So the data cleansing for this um, oil rate includes a couple of things. The first thing I want to identify if there was a specific negative uh, flow event. Or maybe if there was a specific uh, zero, zero flow event, which means maybe the well is not producing anymore. And uh, as Kiel mentioned, we have these two events uh, showing up. And by just looking at this capsules page, you can see that some negative events, but it was pretty short, about like five minutes uh, duration. Then I'm going to remove those events from my uh, oil rate data and kind of smooth it in a way that I can take a look at it in a better um, way and I would be able to kind of uh, contextualize my data. You can see that in here, uh, I was able to smooth my oil rate and I was able to take the take um, kind of use different uh, type of uh, functions that we have in SIG for uh, data smoothing. Once I smooth this data, the next step that I wanted to do is actually project the uh, production into the future. What I'm using in here, I'm kind of using the last week of data as the new data are coming in and. Based on that uh, last week, I'm projecting the produ uh, production of oil rate into uh, kind of a month or so into future to be able to kind of uh, plan ahead. Once I do that, uh, the next step that I wanted to do is actually um, kind of calculate my daily production rate. And in order to do that, I used again different uh, SIG analytics tool and I was able to use my smooth uh, production data and uh, kind of summarize it in a daily manner and uh, take the um, kind of aggregate it per each day. After I created this, I am going to use the target uh, values that was provided per each month by the accounting team. And in order to do that, I created a signal that is based on the target values that was identified. And then based on this, I would be able to kind of identify what is the threshold, how much I am allowed to go below these targets. Now that um, I have this link, you can see that I have my target versus my uh, daily production events. At the same time, I'm going to add a couple of more metrics, including the last seven day of production. And it will be always taking the average of the last seven day production, and it will update every day on a daily basis. Also, I'm going to take a look at the monthly production uh, and compare it with our target. As you can see in this picture, kind of it's a really, um, we have all of the metrics that we calculate in here. I'm going to start with um, basically different type of calculation. So uh, let me click on the next link because I already have my uh, boundaries as well. Okay, this one is good. As you can see in here, uh, let me remove some of these. You can see my target was highlighted for each month in uh, green. Also, the actual monthly production that I was calculating is highlighted in red. And uh, this blue signal that we have is actually the 
average over the weekly uh, production that is updating every day and it is always looking at the last week of data. Now that I have all of these, I also highlighted the kind of area that if there is the if there is some production for our months that is below this um, area, which is our boundary, then we want to be notified. And with this, I'm going to kind of start creating some uh, kind of conditions which are uh, flagging if there is any deviations from our target point. As we can see in here, I have uh, all of the metrics that was uh, needed for this analysis. And by just looking at all of these metrics, you can see that uh, I can add my production warning and I can add my production alerts. Uh, right now, for uh, this specific well that we are working on, it is showing that there is a warning that if we are product producing within the same rate, probably we will go below the target point that um, was specified. Now, as you can see in here, all of this analysis have been done just for one of the bells. If I click in here, I can see all of the data for this specific well. However, if I go to my wells, uh, as a, tree, as a production engineer, I know that I am working at least with a couple of hundred uh, wells at any day, and I'm monitoring all of them uh, at the same time on a daily basis or weekly basis. So how can we scale up to um, monitor all of these wells for this type of simplistic analysis? The next step that I want to look at, I just want to highlight just the problematic wells. And I'm going to scale out my analysis. As Kiel showed you, right now we are in the uh, tree map format and it is looking uh, at all of the wells within the asset that I had. And maybe this asset is coming from Pi AF or any other historian. Or if uh, there is no asset, you would be able to kind of create, you leverage uh, seek data lab capabilities and create the uh, specific uh, customized asset trees as well. In here, it looks like that by just looking at this during this specific day, there are a couple of uh, wells that the monthly average was below the target plan. However, there are there is one well as we saw earlier that is uh, no, it's not in an alarming point, but we do have a warning that it may fall below the uh, target. The next step after this that I want to kind of investigate even more, I want to see for this example, I want to see how, if any of my wells were kind of uh, producing no flow, but maybe we had some flowbacks. And in order to do that, I did, uh, as you saw earlier, I was using this zero flow and negative flow, and I was creating those two conditions. Now I'm just going to monitor those two across all of these different wells as an example of our kind of uh, root cause analysis investigation. So I'm going to click on this one. Now I'm just looking at all of the wells, and I'm seeing that out of all of the wells, there are two wells that have some issues. And if uh, I made my screen a little bit big, that's why I am seeing this. Okay. As you can see, for well 13 and well 6, we had some issues. But again, when I was talking about uh, kind of like different wells, usually the production engineer has access to about 300 wells. And they just want to, they don't want to see these green ones because they are normal. There is no concern about those. However, they just want to focus on these red ones where actually there is something happening because those are the wells that you need to take some actions. So how do we just, from this view, go and just summarize the kind of um, metrics and KPIs that we have for the problematic wells. 
Um, the next step is now, as again, Kiel showed. In this case, for this example, we are just uh, focusing on zero flow and negative flow. And as you can see, as soon as I switch to my uh, table view, and as soon as I enable all of the assets that are in my well asset, um, then it will just show me the problematic uh, areas. You can see that there were two instances that issues and the issue was the negative flow. Also, you can see a similar event happened in uh, well 13. As you can see in here, the duration of these uh, events was really short, but it gives me the exact time and date when it happens, when I can kind of navigate and make sure that what is going on within this uh, the, these two wells. After this, maybe uh, the production engineer wants to do further analysis and do its own type of analysis. Because up to now, let's say this is a template that will, was built with the whole group. But we want to just investigate a little bit more. Maybe you want to aggregate some data a, a little bit more. Or Maybe you want to create uh, some more KPIs and metrics to see what's actually going on. In order to do that, we go back to the data panel. Right now, I am in this uh, wells asset, which is highlighting all of the wells that I have. I'm just going to click on reset. And you can see that there are different assets that is enabled for me to see. Now, under this, uh, we do have an asset group capability. What does it mean? I'm going to give you a quick demo. As you can see in here, as soon as I click uh, to create, it helps me to kind of create a new asset, customized asset based on the previous either assets or the signal calculations or any type of KPIs that uh, you have. In here, I want to add a couple of different assets. I click on this add asset and then for the columns i want to make sure that uh, i want to have this asset or like if if i want i would be able to add different signals to this specific asset for now i am going to keep it as it is as soon as i clicked on this asset or add asset you can see that all of my asset trees has changed as well However, I just want to focus on well 6 and well 13. So I, I want to look at all of the data within those two assets. I am just going to click at this asset and add this well 13 asset. Okay, I clicked on that. You can see that it added all of the signals that already provided either by the historian or maybe if you created this customized asset using seek data lab the next step that i want to investigate more is actually add some columns and i want to add some calculated items and apply it to these only these two wells so it is asking me do you want to use the existing item in this case yes i'm going to just click next and in here i have the list of all of the existing items I am going to just, as an example, take a look at uh, maybe um, maybe set point or valve opening or maybe uh, any of these. Let's say, for example, monthly target or let's say current production alert or uh, or current production one. As soon as I select which one I want to look at, then I can click next. And it, it is telling me that the name that would be show up in the asset is column two. So I'm going to change the name to say like, this is my test. And it is saying that, uh, as you can see, it is going to apply to all of the different uh, assets as well. And then I'm going to add this one as the calculated item, which is going to show up in here as well as the test. It says that it added it all of to all of the wells that I am looking at. Also, it added it to this specific asset that we had originally by default. Now that I'm happy with this uh, asset structure, 
I would be able to uh, save and have this asset available. You can see that um, I do have this asset groups four. If I click on it, it has the exact items that I wanted to look at. And if I drill down to well six, you can see that I have this test condition to do more investigations as well. Now, if I look at the original well asset that I uh, had or it was provided to me, this is my well asset. And if I look at the exact same well six, it doesn't have that condition. So this capability will allow you to kind of apply um, different type of calculations to the asset. And if there is a little bit a uh, change within your assets, it helps you to do more um, kind of tuning to your calculations as well. The last part that was uh, kind of requested for this specific uh, use case was actually once you do this type of analysis, you want to maybe uh, monitor the three to seven day average. Maybe if there is a negative or zero flow, you want to monitor that one as well. Alongside if there are some issues with the delta pressure valves or pumps or different uh, equipments or components of your facility. In order to do that, we kind of summarize different approaches for different uh, objectives in here. And we summarize the result of all of them into a dashboard. So now, as, I can, as you can see, I usually seek organizer topic in our um, dashboard. And uh, it helps the different uh, groups within the same company to collaborate with each other. And as you can see in here, I do have different pages which allow me to maybe if I want to kind of have a high level overview and uh, monitor it maybe once a month, I can create this page and I would be able to uh, kind of drill down. Let's say if my one of the sites have some issue, then I would be able to drill down to that specific site and see what is actually going on. Now that I have this uh, specific information for this site, you would be able to kind of, if there are some work orders that are coming from SAP or maybe Pi event frames, you, you would be able to bring all of them in here. Also, you can do some, uh, you can summarize some of your analysis that are specific to this uh, site. As Kiel mentioned, um, we just covered the root cause analysis. And there are two other items. And in this case, I'm just going to uh, focus on the well dashboard. As soon as I click on this well dashboard, it uh, shows me the dashboard that I created for the, uh, the uh, production team. As you can see in here, I summarized kind of all of the uh, analysis in one page that I did in the uh, Workbench. So the first one, as you can see, this is my well production uh, tracking compared to my targets. Also, I am monitoring the zero flow or ne negative flow, as well as if there are some uh, perf performance deviations within the last seven days. And finally, if there are some deviations or uh, changes to my DP and if I need to take some actions. You can see that all of them are kind of uh, summarized in here. I would be able to share it with different groups of people in my company and give them access uh, and the link. I would be able to create a PDF and send it to the people that don't have access to seek. And uh, if I need to, I can click on any of these and I would be able to just um, take a look at that specific analysis and kind of investigate what is actually uh, going on in that specific um, kind of page that I created earlier. So you could take a look at here. You can see that once I click on it, I am in the view only mode, but I would be able to leverage the documentations, the signals that they created, and I would be able to kind of um, take uh, further investigations. Okay, 
with this, if uh, we can open it to the questions, if there are some questions or uh, comments, we are open to that. Okay, thank you very much, Kiel and Seth. Uh, we're going to go ahead, uh, like uh, Seth was saying, open it up to Q and A. Um, once again, as I had uh, previously mentioned, uh, you can either raise your hand and uh, ask your question verbally, or you can type your question in the question panel, and I'll be reading those out loud. So we'll start off with RF. Uh, has his hand raised? If you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, or I'll unmute you. So it's not long again. So if you'll uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Well, I guess while we're waiting on uh, RF to get that accomplished, I'll go ahead and uh, start with a question and RF will go, we'll try to come back to you again. Uh, first question I have here is, uh, how long would it take to train a model for failure detection? There's an ESP uptime use case on your website. Could similar logic be applied to gas lift and rod pump wells? Yeah, actually that's a really good question. So um, it depends. If you have some asset structures, then as I showed you, you would be able to kind of uh, create those uh, analysis for one ESP and then apply it across all of the ESPs that, we have, that you have. And it's kind of not taking much time. If you need to do some tunings for different uh, ESPs, let's say each of them is a little bit different uh, with the other one, then um, as long as you add all of those tuning parameters in your asset tree, similar in a similar way that I showed it to you, then it will be specialized to the asset tree uh, to the sorry ESP itself, and you can just make the tuning and monitor them. So in terms of time, I want to say compared to the analysis that you are doing maybe in Excel or other kind of programming tool, it takes like, it's just a matter of hours, depend on what is the size of your, uh, your asset or like how many ESPs you are looking at. Kiel, do you have any more comment on that? No, I think, I think you've covered it well. Um, you know, I, I think, I think it's, I'm going to say a lot of this, you know, how long things take or, you know, how long does it take to implement or train? It's, it's highly dependent on the use case, your data, your data quality. Um, you know, I, I think there's inf unfortunately no silver bullet answer to any of those. Right. Um, but I think generally speaking, um, you know, once, once you clean up your data, it really shouldn't take too, too long uh, as long as you have kind of, that knowledge, subject matter, expertise to know what good looks like versus bad. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, let's see, I have a question myself because uh, I know of uh, having to deal with like uh, managing, implementing uh, different uh, software packages and things like that. Um, you were able to talk about building out, say, a project and then sharing it to others um, so are you able to provide different permissions to different groups? Say if you want some to have just, you know, an access to it read only, they don't change or anything like that. Do you have different versions of it going out or, you know, um, is it scalable to where like, uh, you only have certain developers and everyone else just kind of, you know, has access to just looking at the data, uh, maybe being able to click on one of the, uh, one of the visualizations and, and uh, you know, dive into a little bit more, but not having full access, like say a normal developer or even a, a, you know, a, a data scientist going into to the Python or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We've got, um, you know, with every uh, workbench, you can set access controls on uh, a parent folder, each analysis individually. You could even do it at the tag level. So if you create a calculation, you could lock down just the calculation, but uh, give people access to the workbench to create their own new calculations. So those are some options available. Um, so we have a pretty good integrated security system that way um, to you know, be able to manage that. The other option obviously is, is the organizer topic, right? So um, you could have developers working in workbench and then pushing things into uh, an organizer topic where it's all gathered and it could be a view only. 
and then the content itself is still clickable to any user that's viewing it in organizer and it would take them to a read only copy in workbench um, and read only still gives you the capability to add your own formulas and things like that in that moment so it's kind of like a sandbox environment i guess um, where you can do you know you know so some some added visualization analytics uh, extra tags and, and things like that Okay, that's cool. That's cool. That's yeah, that's really useful. Very handy. Um, yeah, let's. Yeah, I was just gonna add something that like re really seek fills kind of that gap. You know, we're particularly from uh, upstream operators that are big Spotfire users, for example, is like operations engineers have dashboards and use cases that they have typically addressed in Spotfire, and they have to go to kind of a Spotfire admin or a power user, right? And they implement something, and then they get in line with everybody else when they want something changed, right? And so uh, Seek is really, you know, from a, we have a suite of applications, obviously Workbench that was highlighted quite a bit today is really purpose built for a process engineer to do a lot of these things on their own. And then the Jupyter environment is meant for the data scientists, right? And then to enable collaboration between the two, right? everything hyperlinks and ultimately works off the same server. Um, so we're uber focused on enabling self-service analytics. So you're not bottlenecked through like the proverbial data scientists, like every tower or, you know, an admin for other like BI tools. Awesome. That's great. Um, this is another personal question for me because uh, I thought that was really kind of cool. Uh, the journaling thing, and this was some, uh, one of the other, uh, I've been co having conversations on the side here with a few of the other uh, attendees, but um, they thought it was really neat. The journaling thing uh, on the side seems very useful. Um, the question I have is, like, I know like certain parts of it were like, you know, do this kind of thing or this kind of operation or you do this. Um, can you actually take those individual steps and say like, do you want to apply that one step to another thing or maybe, maybe a few of them uh, kind of pull those into maybe another part? So you're not, so you're like, uh, you have a workflow um, that you really like and it's only a, a few of those steps together. Like you can create that and then just implemented in different portions and things like that. And so you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're thinking of like being able to, you know, create a calculation work step, if you will, and then scale it to other tags easily or bring it into another workbench or something like that. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, even if it's, or maybe a few of them, right. So if it's, if it's a series of steps that you decide, well, you know, I want to scale it to, to a different project or to some other thing, it's, it's extremely useful. Um, and then after that also can, is, say for instance, um, you know, a, a lot of problems with uh, doing any kind of analysis uh, in, in this industry is that, you know, certain people may be doing things quite a, a little bit differently. So it's hard to standardize uh, what calculations are, you know, and how do you deal with that? And so um, if, that's a, if that's available, is there a way to say capture uh, you know, certain series of steps, you know, and say, okay, this is the way we calculate this in this company. And this is how we want you to do that. So if you're going to calculate or do this thing or do this kind of analysis, here's how you do it. And that way everybody's looking at it the same way and everything. Yeah. 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 So we do, um, you know, and, and I think the functionality I would probably point to that meets that need best is what we call user defined functions. And this is where you can take like multiple uh, tool steps or formula steps and basically bulk write them into one, call it one formula essentially. And then you can package that up. So you can actually write formula documentation around it. You can say, you know, this is my company underscore function, right? And then all users can leverage that. You can use revisioning, um, you know, and you can have, a, again, a, a central team that manages that specific calculation. Um, you know, we've seen people do that for things like you gotta mention, like we do this calculation this way in this refinery, uh, but it's different in another refinery. So then they'll kind of say like site one calc and site two calc and they're all packages and people in formula would then just type in site one calc and all the signals that need to go into that calculation or conditions uh, and then you would execute it. So that's a way that you can then streamline that effort so people aren't having to do the same thing over and over or uh, you don't have slight variations in, in what people are doing. The other thing that comes to mind is maybe you could add all of those calculations into your ad, uh, asset structure 
And then this way, even if each site is a little bit different with the previous site or the other site, uh, it enables the end users to use the same template. So the calculations would be kind of consistent across all fleet. However, if they want to do a little bit tuning, let's say if you are monitoring the temperature, if you want to be above cer certain threshold, for the first asset, you, you need to be like, let's say 100, for the other one, you need to be 95. So it still allows you as the user that do those kind of fine tunings on your assets as well, while you are using the uh, kind of consistent type of calculations. Oh, okay, that's great, that's cool. The, 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 both of those seem very handy. That's, that's really nice. Um, another question, how long would it take to build something like the well monitoring dashboard? Um, is there a way to, well, let's go with that part first. Well, Sep, you just built it, so. So uh, for this use case, I kind of uh, created a Seek Data Lab project that I pushed all of the wells into the asset tree. And it's kind of a matter of hours, like couple of hours, if you know uh, what type of calculations you are going to do. There are some certain, as uh, Kiel mentioned, there are some certain data cleansing that once you look at your actual data, you may need it and you didn't know it. Or maybe there are some specific tunings that may be a little bit time consuming, but I want to say it's just a matter of hours to do this once you know exactly what you want to do. And also, let's say, uh, if you want to create the same workbook for all of your wealth, or maybe if you want to do different types of analysis for different assets, we have some specific templates that do, can duplicate your analysis. And it's kind of a script that is running on the back end and kind of duplicate all of your analysis and you would be able to just apply it for different assets. Yeah. So like, yeah. it's just, it depends on um, the use case. I wanna say it's not a kind of general answer. Yeah, it's, and, and I, I think, you know, the benefit I really see in Seek is the ability to iterate rapidly as well so you know with the capability of some you know basic asset creation in the ui with formulas uh you know be able to create it on a few assets quickly test out whether the formulas that you're building are working right and then kind of scale it out a little bit more and it's just really quick to iterate through so the initial build really doesn't take long but as we know once you scale it to 100 assets you know there's always going to be some fine tuning along the way I find that's really the piece that it's super simple to update that template or update just that formula and then again relaunch and, and that's why we have those programmatic tools to programmatically scale um, you know across the entire the entire asset base and that's frankly why we called this presentation faster time to insights using seek because I think that is really what differentiates seek is that a user on their own could quickly get to this solution. You don't need to go through the machine of builders and developers necessarily to get to that value. Um, and I think that's really the, the differentiation of Seek. No, I definitely see that. That's, that. That was one thing that was really easy to, to notice in that. And also to kind of add on that, uh, it seemed like uh, having, having the, uh, how much documentation that's actually kind of built into it with the journaling and everything else, um, you know, we you have an issue with you, you have developers that, that create something or even, you know, an engineer that's created some tool. And, you know, especially in this environment right now, you know, we've got a lot of turnover. And so, you know, uh, they don't always do a good job of, of documenting what, how they've accomplished something or what kind of analysis they were doing or what was going on. And this, this does kind of, you know, keep it all together in one location, you know, instead of having to you know, go in and, and uh, have them uh, kind of debriefed on what they were doing and everything else that helps with that as well. Definitely see the, the value in that. Um, well, let's see, I'm gonna wait another second or so. I don't know if any other questions are coming in right now. Um, I'll wait and see. Ronnie, I have a question. Uh, okay, go ahead, Anthony. Apologize, sorry for the answer. So you it looks it looks like you have the ESP. So like say if we have a field as like ESPs, rod pumps, and uh, gas lift wells, could you like say okay this well is on ESP? Could you apply like ESP 
for failure prediction models to that well and is like the seek is smart enough to like figure out which type of well it is or is there i don't know, just trying to think of like a one-stop shop where you can go monitor your wells and then have it sort of like predict failures and all this stuff for all the different lift wells based on lift type is there yeah i i mean it's just it would it would be a little bit of configuration right like so uh there's a couple ways i could think of it a lot of people will have uh you know a tag with with something like that in a string signal that just kind of says like what lift mode it is um and then in seek data lab when creating for instance an asset structure you could then use that tag information um to then know which formula to grab off the shelf so to speak right so imagine if you had a user-defined function for each of your lift methods rod esp gas lift um you would then in your asset tree creation where you're trying to scale this analysis across all of them, you would say, okay, what lift mechanism is it? Go grab this UDF, apply to this specific well, and then do that on all the wells. And then, you know, let, let the, basically let the script just run through it. Yeah, the, the comment that I would make to that is uh, having uh, worked for, for Weatherford in my past life, right? We sold what used to be Lois. And then of course, it, you know, Xbox is the 800 pound gorilla. You can't see like Dynacards. You're not going to have, you know, dyna cards and seek some more of the physics based, you know, side of things, right, um, as, as well. Um, but we can be the data driven approach and we have tons of, you know, upstream companies that are using seek for, you know, optimizing production with different types of artificial lift. Um, but, you know, at this point right now, we don't have like a dyna card viewer. Um, but that isn't to say that there aren't other things that, you know, you're not, you don't have kind of the self-service. You know, data cleansing and like calculation capabilities available in like an Xbox or or um, or whatever it's called now, Foresight, I guess, right? You're going to have an out of the box, a physics based like data approach, right? Um, to Dyna card matching and like all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, uh, we probably fill gaps that you can't do in kind of traditional artificial lift software. Okay, cool. And I guess one more well, we were talking about Dynacards. I know that uh, I remember when I saw this. I saw a presentation on, on someone because you're able to utilize the entire Python uh, library. Is my understanding correct? Um, yes. I believe there is a package. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go back to the one presentation yeah. and find it. Yeah, that you can actually bring that in. Yeah, yeah. and do that. So um, yeah, I, I once once I saw that uh, you know you're able to use, utilize the entire Python uh, library, which is powerful in itself. Um, and utilize it inside your platform. That that really does open up quite a bit of of, of range for you guys. And so, um, yeah, I, I think the question you guys caveat uh, should have been like in work in like Workbench, right? Where it's a uh, it's going to be your your more traditional trend type view value timestamp. So yeah, obviously yeah. In in any bot or a Jupyter environment, the world's kind of your oyster as it pertains to visualization and stuff. Right. Okay. So um, we're getting close to time. I'll go ahead and uh, wrap things up and say thank you very much, uh, Kiel and, and Seb and Kenneth for joining us from SEEK. Uh, we, uh, on behalf of uh, our group, we appreciate having you here. And um, after this, uh, the recording will be available to those that would like to see it. Uh, we do have it on our website and we'd be willing to share it with you guys and with anyone else. Thank you guys again. Enjoy your afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks we appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks for your time. Bye.